Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan and today's episode is sponsored by just me. And uh, I want to tell you guys some stories. This is Marine Battalion Engineer Vitaly Skakun. He died blowing up a bridge separating Crimea from the mainland and he slowed down an entire Russian armored column. Let me also tell you the story of 13 Ukrainian border police stationed on this tiny island known as Snake Island. When a Russian warship demanded that they surrender, this is what their answer was. They all perished as a result. Let me tell you a story of every 18 to 16 year old Ukrainian male enlisting into the Ukrainian military and making Molotov cocktails to throw at Russian tanks as they enter their cities. Let me also tell you the story of the thousands of Russians who risked their life and freedom by protesting against Putin's regime. All these men and women are weighed down by the tremendous weight of their ironclad ball sacks. And yes, this is happening right now. We here in the West cannot help Ukraine from a military standpoint because nuclear powers cannot fight each other. And so we sacrifice Ukraine to Putin, who wants nothing more than to drag the West and America into a conflict so he can rearrange how the world works. And should Ukraine fall to Russia, there's a very good chance that NATO and Russian forces will engage. And there's a good chance that we will all die from this. So please, petition your politicians, your local politicians, tell them to send aid, not just monetary aid, but military supplies, you know, weapons, armor, medical supplies, anything. We'll also link in the description down below several charities that are supporting Ukrainian civilians and armed forces. The Ukrainians, whether they realize it or not, are fighting not just for themselves, but for the rest of the free world, so that this crisis does not expand globally. Thank you for your patience, and I apologize to all of you guys out there. I know most of you do not sign up to this channel for this kind of content, but you know, what am I supposed to do with this uh, platform? How can I say I stand for humanity first if I do not fight against an individual who clearly is trying to destroy the entire world through his foolish and egotistical actions? Anyway, now I'll try to transition to a Star Wars lore video. Okay. In Star Wars, starships are oftentimes classified in the same manner as naval ships here on Earth. Today we'll be discussing how each one of these individual class of warships works and what makes them different from one another. After the Rusan Reformation occurred, massive military reforms swept the entire galaxy, forever changing how the Galactic Republic would arrange its defense. The federal military was disbanded, and the Jedi were removed from positions of power within the military, and most of the funding that was directed towards the federal military was basically placed into the hands of local defense forces and militias. For a thousand years, the only large fleets in the galaxy were the planetary defense forces of large industrial worlds like Quant, Corellia, or Fondor. And so for a thousand years, military tradition, knowledge, and experience basically disappeared. When the Clone Wars finally erupted, the galaxy was unprepared for what was to come. It was around this time that the famous Anaxis War College, located in the Outer Rim, revised their system for identifying and classifying warships. The system will be used by the Galactic Republic and the Empire that follows it to classify various ships of war. First up, we have the Corvette class. These are technically the smallest warships, and by warships, I mean uh, ships specifically designed for violence, as opposed to something like a Gazanti class cruiser, which is really just a civilian ship modified for military purposes. According to the Anaxis War College, Corvettes generally range from 100 meters to 200 meters in length. They're large enough to serve as a capital ship for smaller planetary defense forces or ragtag resistance groups like the Rebel Alliance. Krillian Engineering Corporation, one of the largest producer of medium-sized starships, has many entries that fit this class, like the famous CR-90 Corvette, the Sverna-class Hammerhead Corvette, and the Consular-class Cruiser. It's only classified as a cruiser because it was built during the demilitarized period of the Republic. At 115 meters in length, the Consular-class is hardly even a Corvette. The Imperial military didn't really rely on Corvettes nearly as much, but they did have one specific Corvette, that is the Raider-class, it was basically a picket and escort type of ship that was designed to screen larger Imperial ships from Rebel snub fighters. This Corvette was also used as a home base for small Imperial special operation groups.
Next up, we have the frigate class. This generally ranges from 200 meters to 400 meters. Historically speaking, frigates are built for speed and maneuverability. They fit a niche somewhere in between an escort picket ship and a ship of the line, and are capable of filling both roles. The EF-76 Nebulon B escort frigate was utilized by both sides of the Galactic Civil War. The Rebels used this vessel as a capital ship, command vessel, and also hospital ship. Before they acquired Mon Calamari cruisers, these Nebulon B frigates were literally the largest ships in their fleet. The Empire actually designed the EF-76 Nebulon B escort frigate as a cost-saving measure to replace Imperial-class star destroyers that were assigned to more remote areas of the galaxy, where their appearance was more or less overkill. You also have the Separatist Munificent-class star frigate, which is 825 meters in length, but this ship actually started out life as a security vessel built by the banking clans. Its interior is mainly hollow and built for storage for trade and transport. And so it's most likely rated as a star frigate, not because of its size, but because of its capabilities in combat. For instance, a Venator-class star destroyer, one of the smaller in its class, is only a few hundred meters longer than a Munificent-class star frigate, but is able to take on as many as five of these ships at the same time and win. Here on Earth, a cruiser is essentially an independent ship that travels really well at long distance. In the 17th century, most ships of the line were far too large and bulky to be used for these kind of long-range patrols. This is why the cruiser class was started. This is also why the Xanti class cruiser, despite only being 63.8 meters in length, has this title. Now, the War College of Anaxis generally classifies all cruisers as around 400 to 600 meters in length. This class of ship was quite rare during the late Republican Empire period. During the Rusan Reformation period, however, cruisers were generally used as command ships for local planetary defense forces. He had vessels like the Dreadnought-class heavy cruiser, which is one of the most popular capital ships used in the Republic during the period of federal demilitarization. During the Old Republic period, the Hammerhead cruiser was the main ship of the line for the Republic fleet for over 4,000 consecutive years. At only 315 meters, though, by current standards, the ship would be considered a light frigate. But in general, ships during this period were slightly smaller. Another ship that fits into this class was the Interdictor-class cruiser, utilized by the Republic and stolen in mass by Revan and used against the Republic later on. These larger cruisers were 600 meters in length and featured a proprietary interdiction system that used gravity wells to pull ships out of hyperspace and keep them in real space. The heavy cruiser is identified by the War College of Anaxes at around 600 to 1,000 meters. While some of the ships in this class are borderline the size of a Star Destroyer, what generally separates a heavy cruiser in Star Wars when compared to a Star Destroyer is the type of firepower and armament on board. Simply put, heavy cruisers, despite being heavier than cruisers, are still going to be lightly armed when compared to a Star Destroyer. The Mon Calamari line of cruisers, for instance, could hold their own against an Imperial-class Star Destroyer, not because of their firepower, but because of their robust and redundant shield generator system on board. Now, Star Wars does have some weird naming conventions every now and then, like the CIS Subjugator-class Heavy Cruiser. This was a 4,000-meter-long command ship that clearly was much larger than your standard cruiser. It's more of a battle cruiser than anything. A better example of a Heavy Cruiser would be the Victory-class Star Destroyer. It was around 900 meters in length and looked like an ISD, but it lacked the same amount of turbolasers that would come on later Star Destroyers. Then you have the Acclimator Clans Assault Ship. This has been called a heavy cruiser by some observers, but in reality, this is more of a massive landing ship class vessel. It lacks the firepower to actually take on the role of being a ship of the line. It's more of an assault craft. Star Destroyers are the crown of Palpatine's Imperial fleet. Its very name seems to indicate massive amounts of firepower and destruction. And most ships in this class, which generally is rated at 1,000 to 2,000 meters long, fits that description very well. Whether it's the 1.6 kilometer Imperial class Star Destroyer with over 60 turbo lasers, or the legendary New Republic Nebula class Star Destroyer with its 80 plus turbo lasers. You also had some light destroyers that probably don't belong in this class, like the Recusant class light destroyer. This was a CIS commercial guild vessel that was over 1,000 meters long, but really lacked any significant firepower. It was actually more comparable to a Munificent class Star Frigate in terms of combat abilities. The Venator class Star Destroyer was another ship that doesn't necessarily belong in this category, not because of its size or even lack of firepower, but because it functioned much more like an assault carrier and relied heavily on starfighters for offensive and defensive operations.
Now, some people consider battle cruisers as a um, kind of subclass of battleships, at least when you look at maritime navies. But what separates a battle cruiser is, again, that cruiser element. These are ships that are designed to be independent of an escort fleet and able to operate at long range by themselves. In Star Wars, battle cruisers are usually 2,000 to 5,000 meter long ships that are heavily equipped and capable of taking on multiple ships of the line, and at the same time, able to operate independently. Only the largest military forces from the largest factions and planets can afford such resource-intensive ships. This is more than just a military vessel, it's essentially a flying city. The world of Quat during the Republic era would host several of these massive ships in its orbital shipyards. You had vessels like the 4,000 meter long Praetor class and the 2,500 meter Procurator class Star Battlecruiser. Their mission was not only to serve as protectors of this industrial hub, they're also designed to wow over new clients. The Separatist Subjugator class heavy cruiser, known as the Malevolence, was another example of a battle cruiser. Not only was it equipped with over 5,000 turbo lasers, it also had a massive ion cannon which could disable an entire fleet in one shot. Which again is the purpose of this class of ships. It's essentially an entire naval fleet rolled into one vessel. The Dreadnought class is the largest type of ship recognized by the Anaxis War College. To join this class of ship, one has to have a vessel that is over 5,000 meters long. The Empire was famous for fielding a fleet of super star destroyers that were essentially Dreadnoughts. It's rumored that they had over a dozen of them and many of them were massive, over 10 kilometers in length. The Republic also had a few massive star dreadnoughts defending the core systems and quad drive yards during the Clone Wars. You had ships like the Manator II class star dreadnought, which was around 8,000 meters long. But the most massive vessel in Star Wars history outside of those organic Yuzang Vong world ships is this baby, the Supremacy. Classified as a mega class star dreadnought, LOL, this ship was 14 kilometers long, but 60 kilometers wide. Generally speaking, dreadnoughts had the firepower of multiple battle groups, Sure, they required plenty of escort ships to protect them and screen it from smaller ships, but ultimately, these were the most powerful starships in the entire galaxy. So that is our video for today, and uh, once again, please check that description down below if you want to help Ukraine. Um, yeah, long live Ukraine. <laughs>